Okay. Franz Ferdinand, and do you want to? It's Radio City Talk, and we're doing all in the game. I've got Dan Morgan from the Anfield app and Sarah Halpin from the Blue Room here. And let's look back over that 0 0 draw for the Blues down at Chelsea yesterday. They've been edging closer and closer and closer to the uh, top six clubs, I'd say, because the defeat to Arsenal was kind of bookended by a superb first half and then a decent last 15 minutes, but an inability to put the ball in the back of the net. And then against Manchester United, it was just sheer unluckiness at some dreadful refereeing decisions. Yeah, absolutely. I think, you know, Arsenal particularly, the performance was really strong there. Definitely 2-0 to them, didn't reflect the game, but we took a lot of positives from that. United was a frustrating one, of course. There's a, a, a penalty that's never a penalty, um, and that kind of, we go behind and that kind of throws us off off guard there again need to be a bit more clinical we had Chelsea away yesterday and I think you know people have been we've won four out of the last five games people have started to talk about us I said last week when Chris Uton after the game had said Everton are a really really good team you know they they don't underestimate them this they're the you know the real deal kind of thing that's something forming here um and yeah we've gone away to Chelsea and I think I'd have taken a draw before the game, uh, would have been it would have been a good result. As it happens, we actually had some opportunities in the game. I think Theo Walcott has a great chance where he just needs to take the ball down, and his first touch is awful. Uh, Bernard as well had a good chance, and the same fluffs his chance. The ball gets caught under his feet, but two really good opportunities to score. I think Chelsea though as well hit the post loads of times. Pickford made numerous really good saves again yesterday we defended well um Chelsea had the ball in the net at one point Morata was offside so all in all I think a draw away at Chelsea and keeping a clean sheet there as well is really really big for us you must have been delighted we were I mean obviously I mean we, we it wasn't something we thought was going to be impossible we've, we've seen from Everton that they've been able to acquit themselves in these games this season as you've mentioned and I think I think you touch on something there in in the what what for me as a as a Liverpool fan looking at it in the Arsenal and United game was clear was that after a while it became an air of inevitability that you would then go on and lose the game and I think yesterday that doesn't happen and I I think personally a reason for that is I think yesterday you see the likes of Yeri Mina, Gomez, Luca Dina, who've all played at the highest level, mm-hmm. all played at the, at the new camp as the home. Um, they, they they basically know how to get through a game like this now, and, and that high tempo, high high level octane game of football, they can they can ride it through, and and, and it, Chelsea away doesn't really phase them, and I'm not decreeing you know Everton's form of plays in any way, but there is that collective team that just having players in the dressing room have been there and done it mm-hmm. and can carry themselves in that way, but I think also as well, I think what you're seeing yesterday in terms of shape is that with Mina coming in and his, his athleticism. I think Marco Silva is able to squeeze his players up a little bit more and throw a blanket over them from the back four to the front three and that allows Everton to be a lot more compact and to play in those tight spaces that he likes and to press higher and I think that really benefited them yesterday. You know, you've seen with Keane and Zuma they've not really been able to do that because I don't think he trusts them enough to turn around and be quick enough but Mina looks very athletic, looks yeah. very, very alert to, to turn him around and being quick on the turn so... He might be the one who just covers for both centre halves. When if that's the case, if someone decides to go over the top, but it was just something I picked up on yesterday. I don't know whether you did or not. No, definitely, and I think that's exactly it. He's he's an absolute unit, isn't he, uh, Yerry Mina? And he has got that pace and that physicality and that athleticism, and it gives us that the comfort and knowing that he's going to be able to get back. I think it's really good for Everton as well, knowing that you know, unfortunately, Zuma couldn't play. Obviously, Chelsea is. His main t- is the club he plays for under contract. That um, so we've been waiting for Yerry Mina to come in though. This thirty million pound Colombian international that's not been able to get in the side. I don't think any of us could have foreseen that. But so exciting and nice to now be in a position where you're thinking, who does Marco Silva choose? Because mm. that's Zuma, Keane, and Mina for his full debut yesterday. His full ninety minutes for Everton. You know he he played so well. And I think, you know, it was about a year ago, maybe just less than, that we went to Stamford Bridge and, and drew nil nil as well. Um under Sam Allardyce at the time. But I mean we really just Not so no improvement on last year. Uh, yeah, exactly. <laughs> That's what he'll be saying, won't it? He'll be out on his uh, doing his rounds on his media outlets and saying, you know, I well, I got that result last year. But uh no the the the, the difference 
Dan makes a really good point there as well about the quality of play we've got in the side. Jordan Pickford the same, you know, he, he's gone to a World Cup, he's used to these big, big games. Yerry Mina, Dean, Gomez playing for Barcelona, they're used to going to big teams, big grounds and, and not having that in their mind that they're going to concede a last minute goal. I was like, I was a nervous wreck for the last few minutes watching it and you know, I think the last action of the game pretty much is we we give away a free kick and I'm going, oh, that's it. They've, they've won here. They've won here. Because in, in my head, even still, there's that mentality. But no, I think you've got players who've come in. We've just got chalk and cheese from last season. We went there and we just hung on for a draw last season. But this season, we we gave as good as we got at some times. I think towards the end of the game, Chelsea started to turn it on a little bit more. And as I say, Jordan Pickford makes some really good saves, as always. Um, we know he's got that in his locker. But we defended well. We were disciplined. And we had to go there. We had our opportunities as well. I think, you know, if Everton came away there with the three points, nobody would have said that it was necessarily unjust. So we've got to take huge confidence from that going into the international break. And I think I think Cardiff at home is our um, is our next game, if I'm correct. Um, so, yeah, you're looking at hopefully building on this now and um, seeing what we can achieve. We all knew that this season was going to be a season of rebuilding and, you know, getting the players, the new players that are coming in, giving them time to gel, find their feet in this new system under Marco Silva. But I'm just in impressed with how quickly it's happened and yeah. how much he's improved the players that he inherited. We were speaking earlier off air about Gilby Sigurdsson as well. What a player he's, you know, he's become the player that we wanted to sign, basically. And he's just orchestrating everything. You know, Gomez, has cut every player that... Brandon Silver brought in as well, have absolutely hit the ground running. Andre Gomez now looks like he's been there forever. Absolutely beautiful in midfield in every way. Um, Luca Dean, left back, is like Pete Baines almost. You know, you, you've got Yerry Mina, Zuma coming in, brilliant. Of course, Richarlison, Bernard. I mean, it's dead exciting. It's a brilliant and exciting time to be an Evertonian right now. Doing all in the game on Radio City Talk with Dan and Sarah. The one thing that did surprise me yesterday was Phil Jagielka being on the bench ahead of Mason Holgate and getting on the pitch. Yeah, I know. It, it was a weird one, wasn't it? And there was a point where I was thinking, you know, we had a corner and I thought, tell you what, if, if we end up winning 1-0 here and Jags have scored, you know, someone someone somewhere would have had a weird bet on that. But no, yeah, he's uh, he's come back in ahead of Holgate. Holgate played on Tuesday night when we played Gormeyer in the... Uh, Sport Pacer Cup, which we won, so we've ended that that long uh, trophy drought as well. Thought I'd get that in there. Oh my God. <laughs> <laughs> you drove no? yeah, yeah, that's be. it. Amazing. All those years of hurt gone, oh, mate. Look, have, have Liverpool ever won the Sport Pacer Cup? Mate, we were not the since twenty twelve. No, but you know, it was it was a good little run out for some players there as well on Tuesday night. Mason Holgate played at right back, actually did all right, but. Yeah, I was um, surprised to see Jags back there, but he, he came on at the right time. I think an experienced head and just made sure that we, we saw out that we went there and got a point. What's happened to Holgate, though? Because he looked like the next big thing, the next John Stones, the next England centre-off, and his career doesn't seem to have progressed whatsoever in the last 12 to 18 months. It's a difficult one because I really, really rate Mason Holgate. You know, I think he's got the potential to be a great player, and, he, and at times he does perform like a great player. He's, he's currently playing for the under-23s as well, but he finds himself in a difficult spot now because, obviously, as I've just said before, you know, Michael Keane, Yerry Mina, Kurt Zuma, even Jags there, um, getting in ahead of him. You're thinking, where does he find himself? I think he's got to keep, get, you know, keep getting his head down, working hard, taking any opportunities he gets given when he goes away with England as well. Of course, he's playing for the under-21s there. Um any, any games he gets for the under-23s, just got to keep him pressing, keep working hard, and hopefully he will get his chance. Because, you know, I, I think he's got a touch of class about him, Mason Holgate. I think he can play football for, out, out from the back as well. He's got a bit of flair about him, he's, but he's got a lot of work to do on his game. You know, there's been a couple of times he's played uh, this season where he's not been up to, up to the standard and, uh, you know, a few fans are getting a bit nervous about him. But... I think there's a player in there. It's just about you know him. He's what an opportunity it is as well for him to learn from some of the players we've got there at the moment. But I don't think all is lost with Mason Holgate by any means. He's just got to keep working hard. I think I think there's there's something to be said as well though for just you know how how some of these managers think it's 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 absolutely crazy how we manage these young players. And I think Klopp and Silver are in that are in that mould where I think they would rather develop these players a lot more organically than they do. And we've seen a little bit in. 
in in Anfield at the moment with Trent, and that you can see the manager's thinking about pulling them out a few times, and I think he wants to give them a bit of a break, but he's finding that he can't. And another case in point, you know, we've talked about him before, Ross Barkley. Did, did no matter what you think of Ross Barkley, there's a case that he had too much thrust on him too soon mm-hmm. at a young age, and with that responsibility came. Um, a, a lack of development in terms of he wasn't able to, to grow in, into a footballer. He was, he was automatically thrust into this this period of responsibility in Everton's in Everton's form. And and I think that I think that you look at someone like Silver who's got these players in now and he can he can turn to, to Holgate, to Calvert Lewin, to Tom Davis and say, Well learn from who we brought in. Yeah. You know, you say to Tom Davis, go and train next to, to Andre Gomez for, for five weeks and, and he can he can get him to look at him from the bench and there's just something to be said for that. I think I think generally across the board in this country we're a bit guilty of, of thrusting too much on these players too soon. And you look at someone like Rooney, there's an argument he's burnt out by thirty. Yeah. Because he's 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 played all of his career from from basically sixteen every season, gone right through. And it doesn't happen in these in these other leagues and we don't really take it into account. And I think it's good that these managers have taken that into consideration because these are young men. Mm-hmm. I'm thirty two and I watch more Salah every week and expect him to be older than me. Because of the responsibility he's got, yeah, he's twenty four, sure. twenty five. It's it, you just lose you lose track of it, and I think what we're asking of them is so high, so demanding, so so spotlighted that I think sometimes we just lose track that they are young people. They will make mistakes. They need to grow. Yeah. Just on Barkley, you must have been scared when he came on. You, the inevitable was going to happen. Oh well, the inevitable did happen in true Barkley uh, style, and he he didn't affect the game. <laughs> no, <laughs> no. Listen, like you know. Obviously, I would have loved nothing more than to have seen it work out for Ross Barkley at Everton. But I think that the sour taste that's been left is by the way that he left the club. Mm. Um, and I think a few of the things that he's said since he's left, he's, he's kind of thrown us under the bus a, a little bit with, you know, making digs that he hasn't been coached and trained properly. And he's got a point, you know, I think Ron- Ronald Koeman really was the beginning of the end of Ross Barkley's time at Everton. But he's got to remember as well, there was a time in his career where he had a horrific injury, a double leg break and... You know, it looked like he might never play again and Everton offered him the contract. You know, he, he'd been looked after here and um, I think the way in which he left is exactly, you know, that that's the reason there's a few, um, there's a bit of bitterness about it because it did feel like he kind of mistreated the club, shall we say. Um, and he had a shock in eight minutes, to be fair. Yeah, <laughs> that this... was one of the worst eight minutes I've ever seen. Didn't he? To be honest, it was awful. This is it. And I think, you know, I was saying to you, you both as well before, off air, before we started recording, that Barkley is one of these players that doesn't seem to be doesn't seem to do well when he's getting the boo boys on his back that's one of the reasons he left Everton I think Mm. and I don't think he would have really wanted to play yesterday I think it was too much players like Wayne Rooney Steven Gerrard they rise to these occasions I think Barkley's always been one that lets it rock him and uh, yeah he he didn't do anything yesterday but I've got to admit you know there was a part of me that thought um, you know he'll just pop up and tap one in in the last minute and be giving it all to the fans but no ultimately I think we did we did well held our own at Chelsea and and a good point Right, guys, thank you for your time. Pleasure, Pleasure. thank you. Dan Morgan from the Anfield Wrap, Sarah Halpin from the Blue Room on All in the Game. Just a bit of breaking news to bring you before we go to the news and sport. At six o'clock, Daniel Sturridge has been charged with misconduct by the Football Association in relation to alleged breaches of the FA's betting rules. So uh, this is specifically, uh, according to the FA website, so reading this directly from their website, in relation to rule EA1AII and rule EA1B during the period of January 2018. He's got until tomorrow to respond to the charge, 6 o'clock, but uh, basically the first part of that rule is that a participant shall not bet directly or indirectly or instruct, permit, cause or enable any person to bet on the result, progress, conduct or any aspect of or occurrence or in connection with a football match or competition. It's very wordy. Easy for you to say, mate. (laughs) (laughs) Um, But it can also go towards things like transfer of players, employment of managers, team selection or disciplinary matters. Uh, And uh, then rule B of EA1 uh, is where a participant provides to any other person any information relating to football which the participant has obtained by virtue of his or her position within the game and which is not publicly available at that time. The participant shall be in breach of this rule where any of that information is used by that person for 
or in relation to betting. So Daniel Sturridge uh, charged with misconduct in relation to alleged betting breaches by the FA and he's got until tomorrow evening to respond to that charge. Sorry, next week to respond, 20th of November, so not tomorrow evening, at 6pm on Tuesday the 20th of November. Uh, coming up, news and sport from Adam at 6 o'clock. After that, a chance to hear what Tony Bell you had to say after that heartbreaking defeat at the weekend. It's Radio City Talk. Where's my debit card?